Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our third telehealth webinar. Um, this webinar is going to be on telehealth platforms. My name is Sierra Juliang, and I'm part of the California School-Based Health Alliance, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, if you haven't already, on the screen is the phone number and the access code to call in for the webinar. This webinar is being recorded, and the um, slides and recording will be posted on our website early next week. Also on our website are additional telehealth resources from our previous telehealth webinars. So far we've had two, um, one on behavioral health and one on billing and reimbursement. And our website address is schoolhealthcenters.org. Throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and type them into the chat box on the side of your screen, and we will have some time at the end of the presentation to answer those questions. Um, just a little bit about the California School-Based Health Alliance, for a statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. Our work is based on two concepts. Healthcare should be accessible and where kids are, and schools should have the services needed to ensure that poor health is not a barrier to learning. We do this through a variety of ways, um, capacity building, technical assistance, workshops and webinars like today's. And on here on the screen, you can see this is the link to our website where the recording and slides are. And um, well, they will be early next week. Just a little bit of information about our membership, if you would like to become more involved in the Alliance. Um, if you're a member, you receive conference registration discount, you receive member-only tools and resources, technical assistance tailored to your organizational needs, and there's a link on the screen to sign up if you're interested. Um, next in our telehealth webinar series, we have a presentation on medical telehealth, which will be next week at 11 a.m. Um, if you're interested, you can sign up on our website. We also have two more that we're in the process of planning, one on youth engagement and one on consent and confidentiality, so HIPAA and FERPA related questions, which I saw some of the questions that came in with registration were related to that. Um, we would like to thank Molina Healthcare for supporting today's series, and we would also like to thank our partners, the Telehealth Policy Coalition, the Children's Partnership, and the LA Trust. And today, before I pass it over to our speaker, I have Robbie Franceschini from the Telehealth Policy Coalition to help frame today's webinar. Robbie? Thanks, Sierra, and hello to everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Robbie Franceschini, and I help to manage the California Telehealth Policy Coalition. We're a group of over 85 organizations dedicated to advancing telehealth policy in California. And our group represents payers, providers, consumers, and education agencies as well. Uh, kind of the two main pillars of our coalition center around legislation as well as education for stakeholders, which, uh, which is where uh, webinars such as today's uh, fit within our work. When our committees were, were meeting in March to discuss really how we might be able to, to make an impact during COVID, uh, one of the areas that really jumped out where there might be need was around school-based health and thinking about how uh, schools may be needing to pivot really quickly to use telehealth to meet their students' needs and really thinking about what some of those specific areas of need might be. And within that, uh, you know, how to choose a telehealth platform is, is, a, is a question that we've been getting uh, a lot, is not just from schools, but from other stakeholders as well. Thinking about what, you know, what questions you need to be asking when approaching a vendor, whether it's from regulatory questions around HIPAA or FERPA, technical questions like, you know, what kind of internet connection do I need? Um, to, other, to other questions too around workflow and how to, how to obtain consent, how to document it, what are some of the specific considerations you might want to be making um, when, you're, when you're approaching a vendor? Um, to that end, uh, you know, we, we would welcome any of you who are interested in joining the Telehealth Policy Coalition to um, feel free to reach out and let us know. We're open to all. 
And in addition, we have several fact sheets on our website that are available for public use um, for anyone to share, including one specifically on how to consider um, a telehealth solution. So um, we welcome you to access those um, and just really thank the California School-Based Health Alliance for leading this effort, as well as the other co-sponsors, um, and as well to Amanda, um, our guest speaker today, for her time. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it back over to you, Sierra. Great. Thank you, Robbie. Um, and now, without further ado, I would like to introduce today's presenter, Amanda Martin. Amanda is the Executive Director of the Center for Rural Health Innovation, located in Spruce Pine, North Carolina. As Executive Director, Amanda helped establish and grow a school-based telemedicine program from three pilot sites to a 100-plus site program in nine rural school districts, which she now supervises. Amanda's area of expertise covers a wide range from day-to-day -day operations to program design and implementation. With an extensive background in medical office management, she understands the importance and challenges of expanding healthcare access in rural communities. Amanda earned her, her master's in healthcare administration from the University of North Carolina in 2016. And Amanda, I am going to go ahead and pass it over to you. And now I'm the presenter. Hello. <laughs> Alrighty. Thank you. Let's see. And there's the next slide. So let's talk about telehealth platforms for school school based health care. Uh, so I'm going to start with a, a sort of informal disclosure slide because I think it's important. Um, the reason that I was asked to come uh, talk to you all today is about um, sort of naming names. And so um, I just want to be really clear that I'm going to call out several companies that offer telehealth platforms, but that doesn't mean that I recommend them uh, or that I have even used them. I don't have any of those pesky financial obligations or relationships that I need to disclose, um, but I am a customer of some of the companies we'll talk about, and that'll probably come out in the way I talk about them. Um, so just to be really clear about that, I'm not a salesperson, um, and I don't benefit from you all signing up with any of these folks. Uh, but I, I'll tell you what I think and what I know. <laughs> All right, so the agenda for my talk is pretty straightforward. Um, basically, we're here to talk about technology and equipment, um, but you should never, ever, ever buy the equipment first. Uh, I would make the case that um, if you go to a telehealth vendor and ask them what's possible, then they will be the one designing your program. And really, you're the expert. You know what your program needs to be. Uh, so I would say your use case for telehealth needs to be the first thing you develop, and then we'll talk about how to work with vendors and, and what, what you should be asking them. Um, the short answer, if you ever ask, well, I wonder if it's possible to do this with telehealth, the short answer is, is frankly yes. Uh, just about anything's possible. The technology's gotten so fast and so good and so reliable that there's, there's very little we can't do, um, but you'll see. Okay, so we're going to talk about the use case. We're going to talk about vendor considerations, sort of what to ask, what to think about, um, pitfalls to watch out for, where you can get additional resources, because there's no way I can tell you everything you ever wanted to know. Um, and then we have time for Q&A at the end. Um, I think it was mentioned already, but I'll say it again just in case. There is a Q&A function, which you're welcome to write your questions as we go, um, and we'll address them at the end. All right. So this is where I'm from. I'm in North Carolina, way on the other side of the state. It's already mid-afternoon here. Um, and uh, I just, I feel like it needs saying sometimes. I, I gave a, um, a presentation in North Dakota several years ago. I actually flew to North Dakota to give the presentation. And this slide turned out to be really useful because people kind of knew that we were on the coast, but they didn't really know where I was. So I'm on the other side of the state, but I'm in the western part of North Carolina in the mountains. So the Appalachian Mountains run right along the Tennessee and North Carolina border. And that is where uh, I live and where we run the Health E Schools program. So Healthy Schools um, is run by this, among other people, this lovely team of Appalachian women there. Uh, we're not real ethnically diverse here in Appalachia, um, but we do represent the people we serve. And um, so the Healthy Schools program has been around for nine years. We're finishing our ninth school year. Um, and we're currently in 108 schools in nine counties, nine school districts across North Carolina. 100% um, of the care we provide is via telehealth and always has been. Um, so that nice lady in the purple in the picture on the right, she's a school nurse at a middle school in one of our school districts. 
and she is presenting a patient to our provider. That little red slice there is the iPad, and our provider is there having a two-way video conference, um, and she can see the child's throat with the camera that's being held by the school nurse. So I've managed to talk for three whole minutes without mentioning the uh, current pandemic, but as you can imagine, that school nurse would not be presenting a sick kid without PPE on <laughs> in the future. Um, but we used to be more lax all the way last year. Um, so we partner with the school nurses to provide care. And, and I'm telling you this part not because my program's the way to do things, but because um, it's important to me that um, you all know what I'm talking about when I refer to what we do uh, or what program we use or what, what platform we use. Um, our program has been around. Uh, we've, we've done this for a long time and have managed to um, share a lot of information with other organizations around the country about how we do it and what we wouldn't do the same way again if we had the chance, which can be really valuable learning. Um, in healthy schools, we're mostly doing primary care type services, more on the urgent care side, honestly, of the spectrum. We're not doing well child visits over telehealth. Um, we refer those to a primary care office for in-person service. We have not figured out how to do vaccines over the internet, and I can't recommend an unclosed uh, visit over the internet. That's bad. Just think that one through for just a second. Um, so so we're, we're mostly doing urgent care kind of work, um, and then some chronic condition follow-up and a little bit of behavioral health. So that's about healthy schools. So let's get on to talk about this. Telehealth for right now versus telehealth for the long haul. So here's the deal. If there was ever a time to get into telehealth, it is right now, okay? Because the current climate um, is that there are resources, there is attention from funders, both federal, state, and, and local, smaller, uh, and there's a lot more acceptance for telehealth. Um, I find that even right here in my local community, uh, the family doctors down the road who never had time to talk about telehealth, were not interested in it, that's your thing, Amanda, go ahead. Um, suddenly they're all offering telehealth. Uh, and so necessity being what it is, it's a great time. Um, but I gotta go back to those resources. It's not just financial. It's also that there are tons of programs out there like this one that you're attending today or listening to after the fact about how to do this and how to do it well. Um, so here's what I would say, is if you need to consider what you can do right now, while kids are home from school, summertime is around the corner. Um, and of course, right now may end up being if schools do not resume in the fall, which at this point in May, we don't know yet. Um, that's important and you should consider how you can apply telehealth next week, um, but also consider what you'd like to do long-term. Uh, I feel like it would be a waste of energy to um, set up a telehealth program that wouldn't endure. So I hope you'll consider both. Uh, I have talked to several organizations who, um, <laughs> one in particular, who said we spent three years planning our telehealth program, but we never could quite get all the buy-in and all the equipment. And then all of a sudden, in the matter of a week and a half, we were a telehealth organization. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. It's just, boom, we're doing it right now. All right, so let's think about right now. Right now, maybe it's basic video to the home. Um, maybe it's phone calls, literally phone calls to call in and check in or offer therapy. Um, or basic screening, triage um, by video or by phone. Um, but don't, don't be sloppy and don't undersell what you could possibly do here. Uh, telephone medicine uh, is not a long-term plan. <laughs> uh, partly because you won't be reimbursed for it if that's an issue for you uh, eventually. Um, and partly because it's not especially high quality care. That feels like we're going backwards a few decades uh, if we're offering telephone medicine. Um, so let's figure out what exactly it is. Let's talk through that use case, right? How to figure out exactly what it is that you want to do. So here are the components that are important to me from my perspective. What's the need, clearly? Uh, what sort of model are we looking at? Who is the provider? Uh, what are the letters after their name? And what sort of services are they providing? Where is your patient physically located? Um, and then uh, the equipment or platform capability on both ends. So what is the actual equipment in hand on both ends of that connection? Um, and what does it need to be able to do? And then connectivity, um, just how much bandwidth are we talking about? So these are, the, these are the, the pieces that will let you do a good job shopping. 
All right, so defining the need. What are you trying to do? This is not going to apply to all of y'all. It doesn't apply to my program necessarily in all of them. Excuse me, but here we'll talk through what some of your needs might be. Um, are you trying to reach patients at home? Yes, right now, absolutely. Reaching patients at home is a cool thing and it's wonderful if you could do it. Here's something I've been thinking about though. When school resumes, um, they may go back to school, depending on school district and state and everything else, but they may have much tighter restrictions on students attending school with symptoms, right? So when I talk about my program, the Healthy Schools program, our probably number one diagnosis code is upper respiratory infection or ear infection or cough. And all of those are symptoms that may be very strictly prohibited from entering the school. So in order to take care of the kids we usually see, we may need to be seeing them from home. Something to think about. Um, so at home is a possibility. Maximizing provider time at the top of their license. This is what I mean here is I would really love to see our nurse practitioner only doing nurse practitioner work. I want her to diagnose and prescribe um, and not do administrative stuff, not do check-ins, not do just vitals, you know? I would like to see uh, nurses do nursing level work um, and not just administration. I'd like to see administrators administrate. <laughs> uh, so keeping your providers doing what they do best at the top of their license um, is an economical move too. Um, adding variety, variety of providers. For example, what I'm talking about here is you might already have a great physical health program, but maybe you'd like to add nutrition one day a week. Uh, maybe you'd like to add behavioral health, psychiatry, uh, physical therapy, cardiology, asthma, allergy. There's lots of possibilities out there that really lend themselves to telehealth, um, but you may not have the demand for all day, every day. Um, now, I haven't spent a whole lot of time in California, and I don't know where all of your school-based health centers are located, but I know that in my program, serving rural populations, a lot of the schools are very tiny. And so a student population of 250 kids in a middle school might have a call to have um, one or two psychiatry appointments a month, but they sure don't need someone every day. So to be able to bring that service in, you know, on the third Thursday or something like that would be amazing, um, but it would be unnecessary more frequently. So that's what I'm talking about with variety. Um, increasing patient volumes. Um, <laughs> so telehealth can be sort of the attractive new shiny thing. If you've had patients who wouldn't come in before, but maybe they would be interested in trying telehealth, it's not a bad thing. Uh, children and teenagers are not intimidated by video. <laughs> and anymore, I'm afraid that not very many adults are. They would be very isolated these past couple of months. Um, but certainly, we've not had any trouble with acceptance of video care uh, from students. Uh, decreasing wait time is a possibility. If your school-based health centers operate in a way where the provider's only there on certain days, um, you may not be able to have a child seen the day they present. Um, but if that provider is available via telehealth every day, it might work. So for example, when we first started nine years ago, uh, we only had clinic a few days a week. So we were open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday uh, in the morning, which meant that inevitably, kids got sick on Tuesday and Thursday, right? Because that's just how that works. Um, so now we're, of course, open every day. We have a provider available all day, every school day. Um, but we've also learned that there are busier times. And so we can double up providers without needing extra space, without needing a second exam room. Um, because it's all virtual, we can have one provider there all day and a second one who comes in just for overflow times, uh, kind of between 10 and 2 when we're especially busy. And that works out really well and it's very economical and easy to staff. Um, and then finally, expand. What I mean here, to expand at a lower cost may be, for example, uh, to not have to build a building but offer school health services is a pretty big deal um, because capital expenditures are not always a thing that organizations want to fund or entities want to fund. Um, so perhaps you have a school health center at a high school, but the middle school across the street doesn't have one. What if you could use the same people, the same resources, the same systems, um, but pipe it across the street literally by internet instead of uh, kids walking across the road or being bused across the road depending on the situation. Okay, so lots of possibilities there about talking about the need. Um, and then I just kind of want to breeze through some considerations about the model for your program. Now, you already have a, a 
a model for how you do school-based healthcare. It's not exactly the same everywhere, um, but these are all things you should consider uh, if you're already a school-based health center. What's the scope of services you already offer that you'd like to offer? Exactly who are the providers? What are their credentials? Um, what's your sponsoring agency's take on this? If, if you're part of an FQHC, um, will you continue to be able to bill for services provided by telehealth? And if so, under what conditions? Um, that's really up in the air right now. Uh, and and I, I do not have those answers. I don't think anybody does, um, but, but we're all keeping a close eye on it. Um, and then who's going to be the champion? I mean, if you've got a local champion within a school or a school-based health center or a provider's office who thinks this is a great idea, um, that will help shape the model that will be effective for you to get this off the ground. Um, exactly how are you going to connect? We're coming to that good part. Uh, and then can you get paid for what it is you're trying to do? Alrighty. So when we talk about telehealth, we've got the originating site and the distant site. The originating site is where the patient sits. Um, and I always have to remind myself of what these are because I don't find them intuitive. So some examples of where your patient might be sitting as we're defining your model, right? I hope you're sketching out what yours is going to look like. <laughs> so where the patient is sitting um, might be a student at a school. Note that's not a school based health center, but at a school. So perhaps they're there with the school nurse, like in the picture that I showed you of my program. Um, maybe they're there with a non-nurse presenter. So this might be a staff member. It could be the de facto nurse that's the front desk lady <laughs> when the nurse isn't there. Um, maybe it's a social worker, a counselor, especially if we're talking about behavioral health and the referral may be coming from a non-medical provider. Uh, or the students alone, and of course I don't mean alone, but I mean without any um, designated adult helping them. Maybe the student is actually in a school health center um, with a nurse or with a designated presenter who may or may not have a clinical background. Uh, or the originating site right now can, in most cases, be at home. You know, so the student may be at home alone, or if we're talking about a younger kid, maybe they've got a parent or guardian um, doing the clicking, actually right there beside them. All right, so what do we need to think about? If they're at home, <laughs> what I mean here is if we're talking about the student at home with the, um, either alone, like a teenager, you know, on their own in their bedroom, hopefully, or hiding out in their car or wherever, or with their parent or guardian. Um, the equipment we're talking about is um, a smartphone, a tablet, or a computer with a camera and mic. In a lot of our schools around here, the kids were sent home with their um, Chromebook or with a computer from school. Unfortunately, they have to turn those in <laughs> as the school year is wrapping up, uh, so they won't necessarily have access to those computers anymore. Um, but during the school year, they will again. Um, Certainly connectivity is an issue and we're not going to pretend it's not. So if we're talking about a patient at home, a student at home, do they have Wi-Fi that's reliable enough? Um, do they have enough cellular data to be able to use their phone um, for a visit? What's the signal strength like? Is there actually, does it pick up? Do they have enough minutes or, or data in their plan to make the connection? Keep in mind that at home does not always necessarily mean in their home, in their house or apartments uh, or trailer. It might mean um, sitting in the car in the parking lot at the library or at McDonald's where there's uh, free public Wi-Fi that can be accessed. May not be a very private location, um, but it may be where they can connect to you. Um, I would say that arguably right now in the pandemic, there are some cases for telephone only um, medical care, but that's in this desperate time. And I'm, uh, that's not really what I'm talking about when I talk about telehealth. So I'm, I'm gonna leave that one alone. I don't, I don't think that planning for telephone-based uh, care is, um, is a great plan for the future. So that's a little bit soapboxy, but I'll stand by it. All right, now if the student's at school, now's when it starts getting interesting because now we have the opportunity to do more than just the live two-way video conferencing. Uh, we've all gotten really good at having these video chats here in the last few months and lots of people working from home and working remotely. Um, but when you're talking about having your patient in a standard existing site, either in the school nurse office or a school-based health center, suddenly you have the opportunity to add more to it. Um, now you can add those peripheral devices. And I've listed a few of them here. These are the ones that my organization uses. We, um, we have in our 
in our kit that the school nurse operates an otoscope for seeing those uh, eardrums, <laughs> a stethoscope for hearing heart and lung sounds, and a handheld camera for a closer look at maybe an eye or the poison ivy on the back of the knee, uh, something that would be kind of awkward to hold up to the regular webcam. Um, and all of those devices can be used and are used at the same time as the live two-way video conferencing. Um, so some things to think about. Connectivity, now that we're at the schools, I would like to think is sort of less of a challenge. Um, I think that all of our public schools have reasonably adequate internet, and please excuse my ignorance if I'm wrong about that. Um, so connectivity still is an issue, but it's not quite the same as uh, does it, is there cellular service where this person lives? Um, to give an example, the equipment that uh, my organization uses runs off of an iPad, um, and that vendor, I have it written down, that, that vendor recommends uh, connectivity at a minimum of 20 megabytes per second up and five down, which is actually pretty light. Um, the whole system can run off of your hotspot on your cell phone. Uh, if there's actually cellular service there. Uh, so that's pretty cool. All right, let's go to the other side. Let's talk about the provider side. This is the distant site when we're talking about a telehealth encounter. Um, on the provider side, the who, what, where, how um, is a little bit different. So um, identify who is the provider, what's the scope of care, what are the kind of services they're trying to offer, um, where are they physically located? Are they working from a clinic, right? I mean, this is a possibility that you have a provider who sees patients in person, um, exam room one, exam room two, back to their desk for telehealth, and then back to exam room one, and they just blend it in. Um, are they at an existing school-based health center, and maybe they're seeing students in person at the high school and via telehealth from the middle school? Um, or are they a remote worker at home like I am today? <laughs> and frankly, in the Healthy Schools program here in North Carolina, all of our nurse practitioners do work from home. They don't come into an office to then see patients. They work out of their own homes. Um, what do they need? The equipment, frankly, is very easy uh, for the provider side. They need a computer with a camera and a mic um, or a tablet, but only if it's on a stand. I don't know about you, but if you've been on a video conference where someone was holding their cam uh, computer or tablet on their lap and wobbling around all the time, it makes me seasick. I can't stand for it. Um, so a tablet with a stand would get it done as long as there was a good mic um, and a uh, big enough screen to see what they're looking at. Um, and then once again, the internet speed and reliability is relevant here. Uh, if someone's already working from home, I'd like to think that they have some minimum requirements um, already met. And once again, you know, the equipment we're using, asking for 20 megabytes up, that's not, that's not really that fast. A lot of places can access that. Not everywhere. I live in the rural mountains, okay? <laughs> we have lots of people who have no uh, broadband, but, um, but it can be attained. All right, so we've covered the use case up and down. Um, hopefully now you've got a sketched out idea of what it is you're trying to accomplish and, um, and you're ready to ready to go shopping. All right, let me strongly recommend that when you go shopping, you bring your school IT with you. Maybe not physically, but if you're talking about um, devices and connectivity that's going to happen in the school-based health center or in a school, um, I wouldn't go start talking to vendors without having your school IT on board. Uh, so that they can speak to Wi-Fi capabilities, so they can understand what's going to be asked of them down the road on implementation time, um, and also to vet devices. Depending on what the system is like um, where you are, there may be processes about bringing in new vendors. And I say this because we partnered with a university one time to, um, to do a program, and even though the devices were not going to be at the university, they were going to be in a public school system, the university had to get a, um, a demo and they had to have a device they could play with to vet it. Uh, and it was much more complicated than I anticipated. So I'm passing that on to you. I uh, get the, the IT folks in early and often. Um, if you are joining this conversation late or if you fast forwarded to this slide, I would just remind you 
that you need to figure out what you're doing first and build your use case and then go shopping. Don't buy the equipment first. Okay. So, some examples. I'm just going to dive right in. I've, I've got a few to talk about, and these are in no particular order, but some questions, some examples. So, DoxyMe, Doxy.me, I'm not sure how they call themselves, um, has had a surge in uses in the last few months. Lots and lots of private practices and provider offices have jumped right on to DoxyMe because they offer a free version of their platform. That's awesome. That's great. Lots of providers have uh, have made their first dive into DoxyMe or into telehealth using DoxyMe. My question here is what's the cost after the free trial or what's the cost to upgrade? So if you go to their website, you'll quickly see, yes, they offer a free version, but if you pay, you can get this, this, and this. Um, so I'd look very carefully about which of those upgrades um, meet your needs, going back to that use case. Um, depending again on what you want to do, some of the telehealth platforms that are out there are way too much, right? So, so eVisit is one I looked at, and they seem to be a very big player in the market, um, but they have everything. They do billing uh, to insurance. They, you can uh, collect payment from your patients via credit card through the app. Um, it has its own electronic health record. Um, and, you know, and they're serving some very big clients like hospital systems. Um, so it may be more than you need. So something to consider. Scalability I put in here, thinking about Zoom for Healthcare. Okay, so Zoom for Healthcare, I'm a big fan of because we use it and we have, right? So Zoom, everybody's suddenly very familiar with for doing basic two-way or multi-point video conferencing. Um, but what you may not know is that the same way that you can share the screen in Zoom so that you can show your slides or your desktop, um, you can also share the image from um, a peripheral camera, for example, or a stethoscope. So if you have a digital stethoscope that plugs in via USB, you can share that through Zoom um, as a basically as a separate camera, um, which is pretty wild, right? Because so now suddenly one platform would let you do lots of things, um, keep it simple, but also go more complex. We have some pretty good experience uh, using Zoom in that way, um, and, and it's well supported. Um, next. Uh, are the vendors expecting you to purchase or lease? Do they offer both? And which one works for you and your funding source? Um, something to consider here. My program's been around for nine years, and in the first seven years of our program, we went through four different technology platforms uh, because they change over time uh, and they get more complicated, and some of them are better supported than others, uh, and some of them just age out. So um, the idea that you might purchase a telehealth device today and still be using it 10 years from now is probably false, I'm sorry to say. Um, so one vendor I can give an example of is TitoCare. I put the name there on the slide. And TitoCare offers um, uh, small, very mobile portable kits that run off of a tablet or a computer. And they, uh, not off of a computer, on the patient side, it's running off of a tablet or a, or a phone. Um, and they have recently changed their model from a purchase and then service agreement to a lease program. Um, so, but one of the things that has caught people up when they've called Tito Care up to ask to buy, you know, two devices is that they have minimum quantity requirements. So if you're thinking about putting uh, telehealth at just one or two sites, you may bump up against um, minimum quantities. Uh, so definitely watch out for that when you're plotting. Um, and then will it be acceptable beyond today? This is definitely a question that's coming up. Um, it pains me to even write FaceTime on a slide because I would never have said you could use FaceTime for telehealth in the past. But currently you can, right? right today in May of 2020, you can, um, but I would not build my program off of that. Um, you need to have the business associate agreement. You need to have, um, you know, the secure platform to protect your patient's privacy um, and the security of their information. So if you're just trying to get it done today, by all means, 
um, but I wouldn't build a, a program over something like that um, that's not going to last. Okay, a couple more vendor considerations. What is the patient experience like? And, and in this, I don't mean, did they like it? Did it make them happy? Obviously, that's important. That's not what I'm talking about. What I mean is, from the patient side, is there a, is there a waiting room? Is there a way that they can know their connection worked um, and, and your provider can see that they're waiting? Um, or do they just sort of click and maybe they get in, maybe they don't? Um, maybe, you know, we certainly don't want a patient to accidentally stumble into the visit you haven't finished yet from your previous appointment. Um, and then what's the ease of use? Is it well supported on a lot of different devices? So for example, uh, if they're gonna be texted a link to click on, um, does it work on Apple as well as, um, oh, what's the other one? The one that's not Apple. <laughs> You know, will it work on a lot of different phones and a lot of different tablets? It is only going to work on iOS. Um, and then is there a need to download an app versus just click on a link for a truly cloud-based experience? Um, so, so how easy is it? You would definitely want to see a demo of what it looks like on the patient side, especially if you're going direct to the patient um, and not through a presenter like a school nurse or a school-based health center. Um, does the platform offer multi-point? Um, meaning that you could bring a third party in. Perhaps the parent is in a different location than the student, but would like to join the visit. Is that possible? Because not every platform is. Um, and maybe you need a translator or um, American Sign Language translator by video. Um, so you could bring that third party in potentially um, if it had multi-point. That may be part of your use case. It might not be, depending on where you're at. Um, and then, a lot of people stop when they start looking at telehealth platforms and they want to know, will it integrate with my electronic health record? Um, and a lot of them do with the big uh, epic kind of um, electronic health records. And some of them don't, some of them can do it and you may choose not to. Um, in our case of our program, we choose not to. So when my provider is sitting at her computer, just like I'm doing here, she's got her electronic health record open here and she's got the, um, telehealth platform open here and she sees the patient and does the visit and she records it over here and they're not connected to one another. Um, what kind of tech support does the vendor offer? Is it all day every day? Is it East Coast hours? So if you have a problem at three o'clock, that's too bad because we've already gone home. Um, <laughs> or, or vice versa, I've had tech support in California that didn't start until midway through my morning. Um, so, so these things matter and the size and scale of the company matters. Um, a couple more things that didn't even make it onto the slide. Let's talk about the privacy as far as patient information retained by the vendor. Um, so I would, I would like to know very explicitly, um, do they keep individual patient information? For example, if, it, if it's its own electronic health record, then clearly they are. Um, so you'd wanna know that they're protecting the privacy of those patient records. Um, or do they keep just patient information more in an aggregate form? Are they collecting, I don't know, ages or patient volumes. Uh, and if there's no right or wrong answer there, but you need to know what it is um, and make sure you're okay with it. And is it something that you need to disclose like on your uh, registration forms? Um, when you're looking at contracts with a vendor, you need to be considering, are we talking about pricing per provider or per login or per physical site where it's gonna be used? or per encounter. I've seen all different versions of this. Um, and then is there, a long, is there a time commitment? You know, is it one year? Is it renewing? Uh, is it month to month? Or can you stop any time? Um, those are not things that are necessarily unique to telehealth, but I think it's an important thing to throw in here um, because there's probably not one price uh, for any of these solutions. Um, for example, one that I stumbled on um, with Zoom for Healthcare, and I mentioned it as Zoom for Healthcare, not Zoom, because Zoom for Healthcare allows you to have that business associate agreement, um, which at, you know, at a certain level uh, gives some assurance around the privacy that they hold so that it, it can be HIPAA compliant, okay? Um, so they have a neat trick, right? Where they say, oh, well, it's $20 per person per month. And you're like, wow, that's that's a great deal, $20 per person per month. That's how I, I can fit that in a budget, right? Um, but there's a minimum of 10 people per month or 10 users per month. So now all of a sudden it's $200 a month 
and you need to pay for a year up front. Uh, so suddenly the cash outlay is a little different than $20. Um, so just, just a few things to read into the fine print on. All right, so that's a lot of different things you could consider. <laughs> It's not all the things you could ever consider, and I know I can't possibly answer uh, every question that might come up. Um, so I'm giving you a couple more options for places to get more information. Um, so first of all, the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers is not one of these icons, okay? <laughs> but the telehealth resource centers are all over the country, and they are mm, staffed by experts in telehealth. And um, they offer their services at no cost to folks like you and me. So if you need to know more about telehealth, they're putting all that information out there. It's a federally funded program so that we're not all reinventing the wheel, right? Because there's no need to do that. Um, a couple of them that I would call out for you. Uh, California actually has its very own telehealth resource center. Uh, that's the icon in the middle. Uh, or the logo in the middle, and I have linked these. So when you get the slides, you can click right on it or you can Google them. They're not hard to find. Um, and they have lots of resources that are specific to California, but also more general about telehealth. Uh, so you can find some good stuff there. Then um, TTAC is the one on the left. And this is also a telehealth resource center. And while they are actually located in Anchorage, Alaska, which I think is awesome, Alaska being sort of the original frontier for telehealth um, several decades ago, uh, TTAC has, has made themselves nationwide a, um, an expert in telehealth technology. So if you really want to dig into the nuts and bolts of which camera do I really want, uh, what does the connection look like, these guys really know their stuff and they are available to you for direct technical assistance consulting uh, at no cost, which is pretty amazing. Um, and then finally, I would be remiss to not call out the School-Based Health Alliance that has, is the national one <laughs> that has continued to um, grow their resource bank of telehealth um, tools and guidance and best practices. Um, let's see. Yeah, so extra resources, good places to go. These slides are available and I'm going to turn, hmm, I'm going to turn this right back over to Sierra. And Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. That was fantastic. Um, we've had a few questions coming in during the presentation, so I'll go ahead and start with those. If anyone on the call has any additional questions, um, now would be the time to type them into the um, chat or Q&A boxes along the side. So one of the first questions that came in was, of the vendors you mentioned, um, which ones meet HIPAA regulations? Um, and then they also had a question about if they also met FERPA. Um, that's the first question. Uh, that's fair. <laughs> um, so I'm pretty sure that every one that I mentioned, because that they're because they're healthcare entities that are providing telehealth services, that from you know their point to point is going to meet HIPAA regulations. How you use it, of course, matters, right? So if a patient is sitting in the uh, school library with other kids running around, then suddenly we're not protecting their privacy. And it doesn't matter what the vendor does. Um, so so I'm, I'm pretty sure that any of them are going to meet HIPAA regulations. <clears throat> as far as FERPA, I, I don't know that any of them uh, would vouch to meet FERPA regulations because they're in the healthcare realm. Um, so I, I don't know that I can really shed more light on it than that. Um, I did see some awesome resources on Sierra's website, though, about HIPAA and VERPA. Uh, so there may be, there may be more guidance there. Um, but I, I think it's more about how you use it and how you implement it and um, actually operationalize it within a school or a school-based health center um, impacts more of the HIPAA and VERPA than the actual technology platform. Makes sense. Um, what are the advantages of a system integrated um, into the EHR? What, funct what functionality do you get that you uh, don't get when not integrated? Yeah, excellent question. Um, the way that I understand it, what you would get from that is the reduction in duplication of data entry. 
the fancy way to say you wouldn't have to type it all twice um, because the scheduling um, could happen uh, sort of more seamlessly. So, for example, if a provider is um, checking the EHR to see what room they're going to next, where their next patient is for in-person care, um, they would see, oh, you know, uh, Johnny is in exam room two, and they'll head down the hall to exam room two, or right there would just be a link to click to say, oh, no, Johnny's online, click here. And then the provider would go right into the visit. Um, so it's, it's really a matter of that kind of integration, if it's important to your workflows, um, could be easier that way. If it's not integrated, then you may need to have a separate workflow just for managing the schedule within the telehealth platform. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, another one came in, they're asking for your recommendation in terms of um, what is best for a small, i.e. six-person staff for basic telehealth service, tele telehealth, a basic telehealth service, telehealth platform? Hmm. Oh, that's hard because there's so many considerations there of what you're trying to do and who's going to do it, um, that sort of thing. Um, Yeah, uh, and then also how much how much you uh, have to spend and and how whew, that's hard. <laughs> we've had we I, I can tell you we've had good in my program we've had good results with Zoom for healthcare, um, either as a standalone just two way video conferencing or with those extra peripherals um, USB plugging you can buy them on Amazon they're not that hard to find um, kind of peripherals. Um, but we've also had good success with Tido Care, uh, which are the devices that we we give to the school nurse to present um, and use their platform. And my providers like it, and the quality is good, and the devices are pretty straightforward, um, easy to use. They're designed for the home user, for the non-clinical mommy, um, and so so for an RN, they're really easy. That's fantastic. Um, that makes sense. How do you handle, or how would you recommend handling language barriers in telehealth? Yeah, so um, my understanding is that even in a lot of clinical settings that um, translation services are often um, by, uh, by telephone as opposed to an in-person, hey, we need the person who speaks Russian to come in the room, right? Um, and so, so I think that telehealth really lends itself to making that very easy. There are, um, there are ways to, like I was mentioning before, have a multi-point visit. So maybe your translator is also on video um, watching and listening uh, and translating as needed. Or maybe they're phoning in and they're just an audio connection, the same way that people are listening to this webinar just by phone and not seeing the slides um, so that they can contribute. Um, in, in our program, for the most part, it's not the student to provider that needs translation services. It's often when our provider picks up the telephone to call the parent or guardian to discuss a care plan or to verify the history um, of, the, of the current illness, and that's when they need a translator. And so, so that's, that's telephone only in our case. Um, but I, I think telehealth may actually make it a little bit easier. Uh, as long as you know that that's a, something you need to consider, you build it into your use case and make sure you shop for something that will accommodate it, whether it's bringing in a third party by phone or video. Um, and then we have one more come in. I heard a presenter on another webinar say that telephones are HIPAA compliant. Could you comment? That telephones are HIPAA compliant? Yes. Like tele I'm assuming they're meaning telephone, like, um, telephone only, uh, not video telehealth. Ah, I see. <clears throat> um, I don't know why they wouldn't be. I feel like uh, telephones are considered to be one of the more secure ways to communicate. Um, and, and so, so I, don't, I don't think HIPAA compliance is, is particularly a concern with telephone. Um, when you think about all the things that, that we do by telephone already, you know, calling to give you your test results or verify a prescription. I mean, those things are often done by telephone. So, uh, I don't think I have anything to add there. What I would say about telephone care is that um, 
it's not especially high level care, right? I mean, you, you can't see a rash or look in an ear drum, you know, look inside an ear or a throat by telephone. Great, thank you. Um, do you see any questions on your end? That's all that I have on mine. Uh, nope, nobody has chatted a question to me. Great. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. Um, here's Amanda's email if anyone would like to reach out to her directly. And just a few more housekeeping items. So after you close out this webinar, an evaluation will automatically pop up. It's just five multiple choice questions. If you could please answer them, they really help us um, with our webinars. Just a reminder, our next webinar is going to be, our next telehealth webinar is going to be on uh, medical telehealth. It's going to be May 27th next week at 11 a.m. You can register on our website. Thank you, everyone, for joining us in today's webinar, and we hope that you stay safe and healthy during this, this time. Thank you. <laughs>